Okay, so my interesting case presentation happened um, at the beginning of intern year. It was back in August, and I was on a PED shift, um, and it was like around 9 or 10 p.m. I had a mom bring in her three-year-old boy, and the chief complaint was a fever for 16 days. Um, mom said the fever went up to 103. She was having a difficult time controlling it with Tylenol, um, and his symptoms had initially started with what she said looked like a heat rash, um, just kind of all over his body. Shortly after that, she noticed sores on his hands and his mouth and on his feet. And the sores in his mouth actually progressed to the point where he was really unable to take in much of anything by mouth, and they were giving him fluids through a syringe. She additionally noted that his lips were red, his tongue was kind of red. She had noticed some redness in his eyes and some swollen lymph nodes. Um, and through the course of the period of his illness, she said that he had lost almost three pounds. Um, during this time, they had gone to the primary care provider twice for the persistent fevers. Um, the first time that she brought him there, they gave him a diagnosis of hand, foot, and mouth disease. And this was consistent with his sister having similar symptoms and also having hand, foot, and mouth disease at the time. The second visit, they actually did some lab work, and there was some sort of abnormality, the mom told me, that had caused him to be referred to hematology at Mayo. Um, she wasn't sure exactly what the abnormality was, though. Um, she told me that in the recent days he had been um, progressively more irritable and he started to complain of um, kind of some joint pain. Okay, so on physical exam, um, his vital signs, his heart rate was in the 160s. Um, he had kind of some redness in his conjunctiva, um, flushed cheeks, uh, his lips were cracked and fissured. Um, he appeared pretty uncomfortable, was kind of crying and, and definitely irritable. Um, his tongue was beefy red in color, kind of a strawberry tongue, um, and he had uh, some mild cervical lymphadenopathy. Uh, the pulmonary exam was normal. On his hands and feet, he had some flat macules that uh, mom said were kind of fading since the, the start of his illness. Um, and in the perineal area, he had dis a desquamation that was um, pretty impressive. So our differential diagnosis at this point um, so number one, we were thinking about Kawasaki disease. Uh, we also were thinking about potentially another viral or bacterial illness. So um, Coxsackie was in there, uh, scarlet fever, um, and then also juvenile arthritis because of his complaints of joint pain and then um, some of the lab abnormalities that mom had mentioned. So uh, f at this point, we decided to do some lab work. Uh, so we got a CBC, and on CBC, he had um, a white blood cell count that was 20,000. Um, also had a platelet count of 820,000, which we assumed was you know, probably the abnormality that he had been referred to hematology for. His electrolytes were normal, AST was somewhat elevated, and he had elevated inflam inflammatory markers. 12-lead uh, EKG in the department was normal. So his ED course, um, we um, started off giving him high dose aspirin, so that was three baby aspirin for him. We gave him some IV fluids because of his decreased PO intake, um, and then initiated a dose of IV immunoglobulin. And despite the fact that the patient was past the 10-day um, the window where you would normally give IVIG, he had signs of persistent inflammation, so it was still indicated to treat him with that. Um, he was ultimately admitted to the pediatrics team. So his hospital course, he was scheduled for an echo the following day, and on echo, they saw large aneurysms of the right coronary artery and left circumflex. Additionally, he had some wall motion abnormalities, and on repeat EKG, he actually had signs of anterior infarct with um, signs of ischemia in the anterior leads. Uh, CT angiogram also confirmed the, the aneurysms, and at that point, he was admitted to um, the pediatric ICU um, so that they could um, further manage his coronary uh, aneurysms. So he was started on IV heparin with a bridge to Coumadin. They actually gave him a second dose of IV immunoglobulin because he continued to have fevers through the course of his hospitalization. And he was ultimately discharged about one week later on Coumadin and aspirin. So um, this, of course, was a case of Kawasaki's disease. So uh, just to talk a little bit more about what Kawasaki disease is, it's a generalized vasculitis, and it's of unknown etiology. There have been some studies that have shown potentially an infectious um, cause. Sometimes it's associated with um, a viral illness at the beginning, but we're really unsure what it's from. Uh, patients are usually less than age 2, and 80% are actually younger than age 5. And the reason why we care about it so much is because patients, um, 20 to 25% of children that are untreated will develop coronary artery um, aneurysms. So what is the diagnostic criteria? Um, it is a presence of fever for at least five days and then four out of five of these criteria, which are bilateral conjunctivitis, um, oral mucous membrane changes, so fissure lips, strawberry tongue, um, extremity changes, uh, which differ in the acute versus subacute phase of the illness, a polymorphous rash, and then cervical lymphadenopathy.
Um, so those are the diagnostic criteria. Um, the manifestations differ in the acute versus the subacute phase. You have fevers throughout both phases, um, but in the beginning you have uh, a myocarditis, which around week three um, is when the aneurysms uh, usually develop. And the skin manifestations are um, red palms and soles, sometimes some edema in the beginning, and around week three is when you see that desquamation that our patient uh, did have. So the differential can be broad. Um, with the rash, you know, you might think about measles, um, you might think about scarlet fever, uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome with the desquamation that you see later on. Uh, the lymphadenopathy might make you think about Epstein-Barr virus, and the complaints of the child of uh, kind of joint pain and things might make you think about juvenile arthritis. And that would go along with the elevated inflammatory markers as well. Um, so laboratory abnormalities, there's no um, lab studies that are in the diagnostic criteria, but um, some labs can help point you toward the diagnosis. So elevated inflammatory markers, uh, reactive thrombocytosis, elevated white count, um, sometimes they'll have a normocytic normochromic anemia, a transaminitis, and you might even see hyponatremia. So why is Kawasaki's so hard to diagnose sometimes? Well, it's based on nonspecific clinical findings and there's no gold standard lab test. Um, early in the course, it's often mistaken for other childhood illnesses. Kids often have diarrhea at the beginning. You know, if you have a kid come in with diarrhea and a fever, you might just think about a gastroenteritis. So um, because of the difficulties in diagnosing it, the um, AAP actually came up with this um, algorithm, which is helpful. So they recommend that if a child has a fever for five days and then two or three of the clinical criteria, um, it's indicated to assess the CRP and ESR. If those are elevated, um, uh, they recommend doing an echo. And if you have more than three of the supplemental lab criteria, they actually recommend uh, treatment with aspirin at that time along with echo. So to talk a little more about the cardiovascular findings, early on in the illness, um, you can see kind of some nonspecific findings like tachycardia, muffled heart tones. Um, but then when you get to, to actually diagnosing it, 30% of patients they found have coronary artery dilation at diagnosis. So that tells you that it's hard to pick this up in the beginning. Um, aneurysms are not usually seen until after day 10, so that's why it's so important to try to diagnose it early. And those may lead to thrombosis, stenosis, and rupture. So treatment is a single dose of IVIG, um, preferable, of course, to give it in the first 10 days of illness before the aneurysms develop. Um, you can give it beyond the 10-day window in patients with persistent evidence of vas vasculitis and inflammation. Um, and then, uh, of course, high-dose aspirin, which we wouldn't give otherwise because of the concern for um, RISE syndrome. Um, glucocorticoids were used in the past, but they are not recommended um, anymore. So just some overall take home points, uh, early recognition and treatment of Kawasaki is key. Um, it can be difficult to diagnose, um, so we should have a high index of suspicion as emergency medicine physicians. And the treatment is IVIG and aspirin.